there is a part of a person that could, I think, rebel against the kind of reduction of personality that seems to occur as you just humbly fulfill the role of your job. But there's also a total freedom that occurs when you do that. So you just focus on doing the best work that you can. Hey, this is Sharif here with another episode of The Golden Hour, joined by Dr. Kevin Majors. Kevin, good to be here with you again. Hey, Sharif. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, Kevin. Well, we're working on some new features on OptumWork.com, which is very exciting. And as part of that, we determined that we wanted to give people a really good introduction to ideals, which is like a central part of our theory and our approach and something that's maybe not talked about as much in the literature of psychology. So I thought we, we had done an episode on uh, courage, I believe a couple of weeks ago. And so I wanted to follow up and discuss some more ideals with you. How's that sound? Yeah, it sounds great. Okay, maybe this Isn't that one, the whole point of optimal work? I, I think so. Yeah, I was just, exp- I remember I was explaining it to, uh, yesterday because I work with some high schoolers, and I'm always looking for simpler ways of explaining it to to them, you know, just getting to the essence of things. And I gave you my explanation, and then you said, but where are ideals? And so that that made an impact on me. So I always have to keep ideals front and center. Yeah, that's always the the mission we say on our website, I believe, of optimal work is to help people challenge themselves according to their highest ideals in each in hour, each hour of, work of work and life. That's right. Yeah. And life. Okay. We added that. That's probably not on the website. Yeah. It's probably not on the website, but that's the real, that's real goal. People think of optimal work as being about productivity and we always have to tell people it's not, it's about actually transforming the way you work so that you can grow in ideals and the person you most want to be. Yeah. And so one ideal that we can talk about today and do a kind of deep dive into is humility, which is think a very interesting ideal for us to be looking at uh, is one that comes up a lot in kind of work kind of business context you get you get this about to be a leader you have to be humble to be a good professional you have to be humble you have to be ready to learn and this is great advice probably for people coming out of college getting their first job is be humble acknowledge what you don't know be ready to learn from everyone from your failures so anyway so i thought it would be good for us to kind of fill out a structure of what this ideal is and and your conception of it and maybe the different levels of it um, and, and just your take on humility. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. I remember in good to great, right? The, the Jim Collins book, that was the one, the, the most common features of CEOs that were successful was that the people who worked under them described them as being humble. And I think there's something very beautiful about the fact that you could be a CEO of a major company and the people directly working for you say your one of your chief characteristics is your humility. Yeah. Yeah. That is impressive. And, uh, so it, yeah, if you want to get ahead, be humble. Uh, I think that's the main lesson. No, I'm just, uh, so, well, Kevin, maybe we just start, uh, with it, it, where do you think is the best place to start? And this is a, my, my instinct is to first describe what's, what humility is not, or like w- w- someone who's not humble, you know, uh, what you think is directly opposed to humility, or I don't know if is humility one of these, classical, you know, virtues described by Aristotle where there's two extremes and humility is like the mean between two extremes or how, how do you see it? Yeah. The way I would think of it is narcissism or pride, as we've talked about before on, on the podcast, is can be considered a phobia of shame. So the people are afraid of shame or humiliation or embarrassment, whatever you want to call it. There's some difficulty that comes up interpersonally, and it has to do with how others see us. Humility somehow involves total freedom from how others see us, so that that the way our, our the way like their, our, our self image somehow becomes irrelevant 
And we're able to then do our best and engage challenges, no matter how our self-image is like handling it. So that if a person continually feels, you know, shame, like let's say a student in class, you know, is, is called upon, you know, to, and they don't know the answer. How embarrassing is that? How, how shame provoking is that? So, and then here the idea is the more humble a person is, the less that's an issue. It actually doesn't even mean that they have no shame. It just means that it's just, it's kind of irrelevant because they're not paying so much attention to that. They're focusing on instead and what's the most important thing. So if a people, if people could be totally accepting of shame, no matter how big or small it may be, and still then engage the challenge fully, that would be humility in this definition. Just like courage means you can have any level of fear. It doesn't mean there's a lot. It doesn't mean there's a little. You can have any level and you still totally engage the dangerous challenge. So that's not like that could be so that humility is this kind of acceptance of shame in the face of a challenge so that it becomes irrelevant to the way you engage the challenge. Yeah. So do you see it as um, purely just the, the habituation of shame uh, or is... Uh, I mean, maybe one thing, a, a phrase that often when I think about humility is forgetfulness of self. So it's that you're not thinking about yourself. You're maybe putting yourself uh, in last place. You're, you go to the, I remember uh, hearing about like the CEO of a company who at company lunches, he always eats last. Or something. So he's humble. He's kind of forgetting about himself. So how does that relate to this idea of where there doesn't seem like there's an emotional component to it, really, of of there's a, an emotion of shame that he has to not resist but make irrelevant to his behavior, as you said. Uh, so h- how does this forgetfulness of self relate to uh, habituation of shame? Well, I think, you know, first I would say if you address humility in like in its core, which is acceptance of shame, so that it becomes irrelevant to the way you engage a challenge. You'll see that most of the learning then that takes place in our lives um, involves a little bit of embarrassment and shame. And so there's, insofar as humility relates to work, I think it's almost all about learning. But then insofar as it relates to our bonds with others, it takes a much, much higher level. And the real heights of humility require the presence of other people. Because I think that when you get to the very heights, but maybe what we can do is just kind of walk through what would be the depths? What, like the people who have, who have the least humility, then how, do th- how are they relating to others? And then how does it change? Because I think that the, the people who struggle the most with being humble are people that need others to feel shame in order for them not to feel shame. So they humiliate others and, and they're, they're totally willing to humiliate others and, to, and they want to like, make themselves look good, and they're willing to make others look bad. So that's what everyone, I think, calls arrogance. And so in all the other kind of malignant forms of narcissism, they all involve this ability people have to like pass their shame on to others, and the others get covered in it, and then yeah. they don't feel so bad about themselves. So you kind of thrive on other people's shame. Yeah, and needing to always then be the best. Even if you're not like, so at least there's no potential for shame in your interactions with others. So, and you know, maybe people who learn this in high school, they want to like, I don't know, have the best clothes or drive the best car or, you know, and, and, and it's a way of dealing with their insecurities, but that's all about insecurity. So the people are protecting their self image as if it is like a very fragile child. And so they have to protect it so much that then they're doing things to like, obviously always want to be ahead of others. So everything is competitive in some kind of shame that's, competition. I was just about to ask. How does that differ from a healthy sense of competitiveness? Yeah, so real competitiveness is to bring out your own best. So like this becomes a, a great way of getting more out of myself. And so, you know, if I'm, you know, but I think that it has its real limitations, which is it so easily falls into this shame phobia, you know, and I just think the avoidance of shame and un- being uncomfortable with shame makes it impossible for people to experience the freedom that real humility gives you. Because with, with real humility, you just you don't somehow judge yourself anymore based on what provokes shame and what doesn't. 
well, you know, it's like all of that just feels understandable. Okay, yeah, no one, you know, would find this, you know, everyone would be embarrassed by this. So being embarrassed by it doesn't matter. And then you can accept the feeling and you just don't care about it. So it, uh, so there's, um, yeah, the, um, there is like, you know, a subtle art of not caring about what other people think of you. So, and, and it is very liberating for people. And they just realize that they are not their self image and whatever people think of them and whatever, you know, like the way they're being viewed and imaged kind of is irrelevant to their thriving and their happiness. That real happiness comes from the good work that they do and the bonds that they form, not from how they're seen. So I think at the lower levels, the people are really dependent on their self image and protecting it and then even needing to put down others. And that also means that even if you're not willing to put down others, maybe there's like, okay, a step above that is that people can be externally humble, but internally still dread humiliations. So, and that's probably where most of us live. So, you know, that we do dread things that are humiliating. Um, admitting mistakes can be very hard then because it's humiliating. Apologizing can be hard because it's humiliating. Being corrected by someone else can be hard because it's humiliating. I, so I think those are the things where most people are going to get the best pr like initial practice. Learning to love the process of improving so much that they start to see everything that could be humiliating as really the next step of growth. And so it's like a student in class. If, you know, if a guy were always raising his hand and saying things to the professor just to look good, well, he wouldn't be growing. He wouldn't be learning. But if you were to make his ignorance known and then let the professor answer it, then he would actually grow. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the hurdle people have to get over, you know, not being humiliated by learning. And gradually then, fewer and fewer things humiliate people because they're eager to learn and they're eager to improve. I mean, if you're really eager to improve, what would humiliate you? You'd want to be humiliated, I mean, because that's always an opportunity to learn. You'd want your weaknesses to become apparent. Or your yes. Ignorance or and there might be something about humiliation that it'd be hard to directly want it, but I think it's possible actually. You know, that, that you, and it comes through experience too, that you're not harmed by it. Yeah, it's like the embarrassment, it hurts. I mean, the height of embarrassment, I think people kind of want to like lie on the floor. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever gotten super embarrassed, but I think the urge that people have physically where they're really embarrassed is hide. <laughs> like to lie down on the floor and hide. And so, yeah, no one like wants that, but you can actually learn to have fun with it and, and to treat it with humor and to make the most of it and then to learn. So I think, and that becomes an incredible strength because that means you're like, you're just not afraid of things that would be embarrassing anymore. So not performing well in public or, or messing something up and well, do whatever thought experience in your, experiments in your mind you need to do. Imagine scenarios. See if you could learn to love that feeling as an opportunity to learn. And your and the adrenaline you get when it's happening is going to make that learning go deeper. So these will be really formative. Is is that something you do in your practice with uh do you do shame exposures? I have done shame exposures to people. Yeah, and or with people. Uh I also, you know, I I remember once um Actually, no, more than once, I've done this with patients when it was even remote, that uh, I would have them type their most embarrassing thing, you know, in the Zoom chat and get ready to send it, but don't send it. And I've helped people get over social phobia uh, just from doing that, that they were, they could locate the feeling and it was so real, you know, and then in the end, I never had them send it. Of course, it's not like I... Um, I've been, I, I dealt with enough people that you hear the embarrassing things people have. There's just n not really that wide a range of things. And so sometimes people will be so embarrassed by things and then you hear it and it's like, okay, well, I, I could see that that'd be embarrassing, but I don't change how I think of you because of that. And it's like, so you get, I think it's just with a little bit of experience in therapy, and, you know, you end up, these things that really embarrass other people are all very common. Yeah. Okay, Kevin. Well, so this, I think we've covered kind of level one of humility, which is uh, this, a person's relationship with shame. And you have 
the very lowest level where the person thrives on other people feeling shame and then this level two where they're you know externally they don't need to project uh confidence that they don't really have internally but internally they fear and loathe humiliation um so then we had described before and following jim collins this idea in a we had discussed in a business context of or a work environment of um the humility needed to be a good worker, a good leader, to be learning, to be practicing, to be growing. So in some way, having a growth mindset, I would say. So is, is that what you see as being the next level up? Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right. So the self-image that people form in their, and that they try to protect ends up being a fixed mindset. So it doesn't grow with them. And it identifies them with non-essential things, certain status markers. certain. And so letting go of all status markers or all points of comparison with others, just focusing on your own growth, like the student in class, just focusing on what can I be learning here, not how am I appearing. Uh, okay, there is, I think, a very deep kind of growth that occurs when you are open to change to like almost you could say substantial change so that you're willing to become a role in the service of others in your job there's something very humble about just doing your job your ordinary job very well and and there is a part of a person that could i think rebel against the kind of reduction of personality that seems to occur as you just humbly fulfill the role of your job. But there's also a total freedom that occurs when you do that. So you just focus on doing the best work that you can. So that if you were like, let's say, you know, if, if you're, um, any job involves elements of service to others, then it's going to feel like for you know, one's self-image, it could feel like constraints. And like I'm capable of all these great things, but then my daily life just has these very humble opportunities to serve others. So it's like it seems like like it's nothing. You know, people that work from the home and in the home, they they experience this a lot. So like, am I to be is like the, the sum of my life, my professional accolades? Because now I'm working, you know, raising children, perhaps. Well. You no, know, I think that actually humility means that we are focusing on how we can grow and serve others. And there is, so there is like, it's allowing yourself to do that and to be, become that role in a sense. Does that? Yeah. So I think yeah. the, the chance of like substantial change is terrifying for people. Like, who would I be? Will I lose my identity? It's like, no, you're going to find yourself when you really give yourself. You're going to find a new, more deeper, stable identity by, by, with this apparent contraction. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let me – so the, the thing that came to mind as you were talking, and I was really focused on, just on what you were saying, but the thought popped in my head. Uh, I remember maybe the first time I really considered humility was uh, senior year of college. That maybe reflects poorly on me, but uh, was – and reading uh, Ray Dalio's Principles. Uh, and he, so this is a very successful businessman, and he has his own unique set of principles, uh, which we won't go through right now, at least. Uh, and one of them, he puts his big emphasis on seeking, finding out what's true. And this is for his business to be more successful, but he also applies it in his personal life. So he says, uh, you know, develop your own ideas, and then find the smartest people who are think you're gonna who are gonna think that you're wrong, and get their objections, and then change your mind when you see that they're right. So there's a sense that, in that context, humility is involved in the search for the truth. Uh, so I wonder if you could just speak to the like subjective versus objective or internal external nature of humility, because earlier we talked about shame, which is this very internal, subjective experience of things that you're trying to avoid. But then now you were just talking about humility, like getting out of yourself, being willing to change for other people, for the bonds outside of yourself. So 
does humility humility has this interesting dynamic of being kind of internal and related to shame but also related to some external good like in that case truth or the bonds you have with other people forgetting about yourself getting outside of yourself so i wonder if you could just speak to that dynamic yeah so i think there is this element of humility uh and particularly in how we relate to other people that we experience truthfully the debts we owe to others so that there is this kind of um allowing yourself you know, you know the, the the seeming uh, like contraction of self and doing your job really well you know and 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 and, and, and taking on that the on that role and there is something objective in that what it means to actually do this job very well and to actually provide the best service and to constantly be correcting how you do that so that you are truly giving them the best service possible. Um, I think there's another sense in which uh, you know, humility and truth go together um, in that ultimately what matters in life is the or are the bonds that we have developed. So there is something about bonds with others that allow us to transcend ourselves and to be somehow greater than we could potentially be otherwise. So when I think of magnanimity, magnanimity is basically the ideal of how to surpass yourself. Yeah, and magnanimity particularly changes and deepens our ability to form bonds with others. And that's why I see magnanimity really is three things. The first is sincerity and seeking the good of the other and the bond. The second is humility in forgetting oneself completely and attending totally to the other. And then generosity is giving oneself continually, you know, through the bond to the other. So in that sense, humility is like the linchpin of it. So humility then is our ability to let go of the thought of self, which at its lowest level is self-image that we're trying to you know, burnish and protect. But then uh, even at higher levels of development, it still is a self-regard or a self-centeredness in, in our thoughts. But the deeper the, our bonds with others grow, the more then we are living for the others. You know, assuming these are bonds you know, with trustworthy people, real humility then can only develop to the extent that you do hope and trust in the other to be there so that it's secure for you to let go of your self-regard and give that regard to the other while they let go of their self-regard and give their regard to you. So there's this mutual sharing of attention that takes place in every bond to some extent. But clearly, in the more principal bonds in your life, it's going to be more noticeable. So the if humility really is about attention, then, and it's about letting your attention, well, it, one thing, is it becomes like mindfulness in a bond. So humility in this regard is purely mindfulness in the setting of a bond. Your attention totally on the other, not on self. And when if your thoughts do happen to go back to yourself, you recognize it, and then you release it, and then you re-anchor your attention on back on the other. And again, I, I say that this has to be with people who are trustworthy. So before you bond with someone, if you have a cho if you have a choice in the matter, you want to make sure that this is a person who can be trusted to also give their attention to you. So it's not a one way street, and you're not being taken advantage of. Um, sometimes the thing that people have to do is get a safe distance from the other. But I'm talking about this in, in the case of people where the bonds, where the people are trustworthy, you know, then humility can develop as this forgetfulness of self. And it can be a wonderful thing to see. I think this happens chemically when people get infatuated. <laughs> so like as people are, and really it's like, you know, only when people are very young, do they get infatuated you know, as, as your prefrontal cortex develops, that doesn't happen. Um, as much, but but the but that is just a process where the other person has gripped your, the other person's attention, so they do think about the other a lot. And there's probably still a lot of self regard in that, but at least it's like a help in being humble. But the point I was going to make, just to finish this thought here, is that if humility is about then attention in the bond, um, then and your willingness to give attention to others, 
that you have a bond with. But bonds themselves, I think you could say, are a kind of habitual attention. Is that this other person habitually has some of your attention, that they're in your heart in some way. So humility actually is what makes us bondable because it allows us to like pay attention to others. And so I think this happens all the time in life, that we could deal with others in like a non-bondable way or in a bondable way. So like the way you interact with people in your ordinary life, humility means you never use people, even if it is just to ring up your groceries. You know, it's like you don't use people. You're, there's a potential bondability always. There's this incipient friendliness that we, that we have, that we're like willing to give people our attention and, and to the extent that it is, you know, uh, our, our care. Okay, there, I had to say. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I think yeah. that's, a, yeah, I think it's a great uh, note to hit for us because we're always talking about how, I mean, ideals and, and bonds, ideals are meant to serve bonds and everything we're doing in work is meant to serve the bonds that we have with those closest to us. And so, because as you mentioned at the beginning, optimal work is not about productivity. It's about ideals and it's about bonds. And so I think it's a very clear picture then of how humility from the lower levels to the upper levels is all directed and is essential for forming um, these very deep bonds with those closest to us. So I think it's a great great note note for us to hit. Yeah, and so in that sense then hopefully it makes sense too of what it means to rejoice in humiliations or in one's own nothingness and little you know little points of I don't know whatever you call them like you know little mistakes or wretchedness. But you know like there are, there are you know very holy people who would rejoice in those things. And partly it's because they know that as they experience their own limitations and shortcomings, all that does is gives them less reason to give preferential attention to themselves and a greater desire to attend to others. So it's like to, it kind of reignites their the joy they have in having these bonds that are so stable that they don't have to care about those things. They don't have to pay attention. They can rejoice in those things because really their attention is mostly on the other. And so to the extent that self doesn't then become a preferential object of attention, fine, they're happy with that. So that would be the total height of humility. And I think it's only possible in the setting of the deepest, most trustworthy bonds. Well, Kevin, I think you've set a high standard here for us all to aspire to in in living for this ideal of humility. So, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's like when I'm talking sometimes to, to people and that you say something you know, that you explain something like this and they're like, um, well, easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always have to say, yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. One hour at a time. <laughs> that's right. Awesome. Well, Kevin, I think, uh, we're out of time for this week. So we'll, we'll come back next week. Great. Thank you, Sharif, for All the right. questions. Thanks a lot. And for Kevin. your attention. <laughs> that's right. Yeah.